Shut up and invest. All right, all right, another episode of Shut Up and Invest in the House with Jay Money. What's up, my brother? Oh, what's going on, man? I'm doing good. Beautiful, cold Saturday down here in Miami. For real. Like, let's see how long you wear that jacket on <laughs> for this show, because in here it's not that it cold. It is getting hot in here, yes, yes. I'm just Appreciate trying to adapt, you know. Appreciate you coming to pick me up today at the body shop. Yeah, that was... That we was stopped at El stop Palacio the Hugo's. I mean, you get mango juice. <laughs> Listen, all you guys ask, why do I live in Miami? You don't get that mango juice anywhere else in America but Miami. <laughs> when you guys come down and visit us, we'll take you to El Palacio there of are, the Hugo. There are spots in Miami that you think you shouldn't eat at. Like, my wife eats at this one gas station all the time. Yeah. Was, you know, you know, gas stations out here have... I don't eat the gas stations, but she eats at the gas stations all the time. Like she brings there's any, gourmet Latin food in, in the, the gas, gas stations. stations. Yes, like <laughs> I'm all Michelin rated <laughs> restaurants in your local gas station. It's funny because <laughs> I'll be talking to a buddy of mine and he'll say, listen, bro, you got to go to the corner of 42nd <laughs> and 8th and there's a gas station there that's got the killer, killer sandwiches. I'm like, man, get out of here. <laughs> But then I true, go th- I go check it out though. Yeah, I go it's true. because he I, remember I watched that so that, uh, that one uh, Anthony Bourdain episode when he was in Miami and he was at some spot by the airport. I remember like I'm like Wait, this is when I didn't live here. I'm like where's that at? But then when you move here, you realize those little spots have the best food in Miami. People talk about holes in the walls, but out here, oh my goodness, here it's literally like holes. Well, there's a there's a spot. <laughs> funny enough, I'm gonna actually order from there soon because we're throwing a little Getty soon. Um, there's a spot called Suarez Barbecue. Okay. And he used to run it out of his house. So he had like a house with a huge, like, it almost looked like when you walk into one of those landscaping uh, garden sections where you go buy a bunch of trees and plants and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. It was his house and he had it kind of set up that way. But he had a barbecue set up. And brother, for like $5, yeah. what you would get, it would <laughs> fill up a container of barbecue meat. Rice and beans, yuca, uh, fried plantains. Oh my I'm hungry hey, and you can feed like three out of that thing. <laughs> you know they got because there's, there's so many of those the little barbecue spots, the seafood spots. You got to find their Instagram pages now because they'll show you where they're at. The ones that are still like little shops on the street. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because there's one down in the, foodies creating social medias to tell you where to go. Yeah, there's one down in like Homestead by um, South where I live. It's a seafood place, uh-huh. and this guy sells like. Like whole lobsters, shrimps, crab, in the same way, like six bucks. Out of his house. Well, he actually has a little truck now that he pulls up on the side and does it for, yeah. Yeah. yeah but you got to follow him on Instagram and he'll show you where he's at and when he's there, when they're open and stuff Share like that. Share that page with me. That, so, you know what we need to do? We need to add a third day to our mastermind here in Miami just and then just do a food just tour. Food. Yeah. You guys want the you real deal? <laughs> We'll take you on we're the boat take in you the to water. South Beach to eat. No, no, we're taking you to the real spots. We'll take you and make sure you get nice and fat before we send you back home. <laughs> Anyways, what's up, man? What are we vibing on today? Uh, today, I want to talk to. We just released this episode this morning when we broke down uh, the rental, how to evaluate the rental properties, right? And remember, I was telling you that you know I'm, I've been thinking. You know, I do both rentals. We both do rentals and we do notes. And I actually have a theory. You know, that we can kind of talk about. It. I think it might be actually. Better for a new investor to get into notes okay. right away than to get into rental properties. So we're going to break that down. We're going to break that down, yeah. Okay. All right. So investing in what they call mortgage notes. So first and foremost, we've talked about it on other shows, but if it's a first-time listener, what is exactly a mortgage note? The mortgage note is just the instrument that's created when you get a mortgage from somebody to buy a house. The IOU. That's exactly. The promissory note is what it actually is. Mm-hmm. It just lays out the terms, the financing between me and my lender. Um, you know, it's just the basic instrument, the IOU, that tells you the terms of your financing for a house. Right. So if you go get a mortgage, let's say at Wells Fargo, the title company or the closing attorney, the title agent, they're creating, along with Wells Fargo, the closing package. In that closing package is the mortgage note. So in the mortgage note, you're going to go ahead and um, get the terms like Jory says. And essentially, that's what you got to pay off. Mm-hmm. That is what's appearing on your credit report. So it's the mortgage. It's Bottom the mortgage. line, it's the paperwork behind the mortgage. So when we say, how can you invest in a mortgage note or how can you be essentially the bank? Be the bank, yep. Which is exactly what we're talking about. That's instead of Wells Fargo, it can be 
J Money, Bank of Austin, Bank of Austin, Bank of Austin, Bank of Austin, bro. That sounds like professional, bro. Bank of Austin. Funny enough, though, but like when you do notes, yes, it's under what corporation? It's under. It's never under Austin, but um, it's under a different. One. I have NA Capital. I have Jog Investments. Okay. Um, Austin Group is my real estate brokerage. So I don't have any. I don't have a. You, know, you don't have any notes under that one. No, not under that one. But. So and you can have many different corporations that you use for the notes. So essentially, that's a good segue. You mm-hmm. open up a corporation, and let's say you have fifty thousand dollars. Because some people think the only way you could be the bank is if you have millions of dollars. No, that's not true. That's not true. We've been talking about this. I mean, literally, if you have fifty thousand dollars, you go out there and find a house. Correct. Right. That you can purchase, or you well, you find a note that you can buy. There's notes for all ranges of prices. You know exactly. Um, and there's you know there's there's different ways. There's the um, there's investing in you know real estate notes that are already created. Or what I do mostly is we actually go out there and originate the notes. Right. But either way, we want to show you why you know we think it might be more beneficial as for a first time investor to start off in the notes. Instead of an actual Why do you property? think If I was just starting in the game And I'm thinking Most people want to flip a property That's like their step yeah, one They see the flashy flips What's your perspective of saying Getting into a note Might be something that you really want to put That $50,000 to Versus trying to go and flip a property Got it So I'm all about cash flow Again right We're all about cash flow here Because cash flow is what creates true wealth You know you can flip a property Make 5, 10, 15 grand But you have to go out and do that, do that same thing again Right. The main thing when people tell you when it comes to rental properties is what? You have to have cash reserves on the side for repairs. Right. Right. Any kind of repair, any kind of furnace goes out. You might see that your yearly cash flow might be, let's say, ten thousand dollars per year. One furnace, <laughs> <laughs> one furnace can wipe out half your cash flow, right? Right. One AC in Miami can wipe out three fourths of your cash flow. Right. Right. So you could be going for years if you keep having to fix things that, you know, where a tenant moves out and this and that, where you're not really cash flowing the way you think you are. When you buy real estate, no, remember, you're the bank. I've never seen Chase or Wells Fargo come to my house to fix <laughs> a furnace or AC when I was when I rent the house right. out, right? You, you can't even call them pay up. Them every month. <laughs> right? They still get that money. So if if, if your mortgage payment is a thousand dollars a month, understand that they're getting a thousand dollars a month in principal and interest. And the only thing they're paying is any kind of servicing fees, right? A servicing fees are 15, 20 bucks. Right. So outside of that, they're walking away with all that profit and income. When you're a new investor, most new investors don't have high cash reserves, right? right? You don't. So a lot of new investors, usually you hear the people who, oh, I had a rental or two. I'll never do that again. They'll never do it again usually because of tenants and repairs. Right. Right? They just, they couldn't cash flow. It wasn't easy enough because they kept paying and repairs. Tenants kept moving out. When you buy that real estate mortgage note, right? As long as those payments come in, you get that. All of that is pretty much profit. Principal and interest is profit to you right there. So I think it's actually easier to get that because you don't have the headaches of having so many cash reserves on the side that can wipe out all your cash flow. Yeah. And also, I think a lot of people think with $50,000, I'm not saying you can't flip a property, but it's tough because a renovation alone, depending on which market you're in, is going to cost you a pretty penny. Sure, 20, 30, maybe. Very, very few flips out there can you do for ten or fifteen thousand dollars? You can't. I remember back in the day we used to think that we could just do everything for like ten to twelve. That that that's not the and case now. Because look, that's the actual cost of the renovation. But what about the acquisition? You gotta buy the property, even if you use hard money, there's twenty percent down on average, plus the closing costs. Yep. So once you use your money to buy the property and then now you're using the money for renovation $50,000 is a very tight budget. It now is. you're limited to how many deals you can do, which kind of deals you can do. Again, not impossible. I'm not saying you can't do a deal out there if you only have $50,000, but you're fishing in a pond that doesn't have a lot of fish mm-hmm. whatsoever. Versus you can lend $50,000 and be the bank on many deals. I I mean, on average, we have 10 to 15 opportunities for you that uh, in the smaller markets that you could be the bank and potentially get 10% interest on that money. So you're technically investing in real estate without ever having to fix a toilet, to your point, without ever having to fix a roof, to your point. Mm -hmm. 
And you're not managing a project, hoping that you make money. You're not managing the property. You don't pay the taxes. Remember that? The taxes are on the homeowner. You're not paying for the insurance. Insurance is on the homeowner. Right. Right. And it allows you to. Here's the biggest thing. Though. Let's say you live in Miami. You have $50,000. Have you? Can you find a house in Miami for $50,000 anywhere? No. You can't. No, you're going to have to go right? into the and, hard money. But. And a lot of people who want to own rentals want to own rentals close to where they're at because they want to be able to see the rental. Right. When you invest in the mortgage note, you can have mortgage notes in any part of the country. You're not managing the property right, at all, right? So it's a lot less stress-free for someone who wants to invest in other in these other cash flow markets where the prices are lower to get into right away mm-hmm. without having to be there day-to-day managing that property. Now, let's talk about the cons. Because if uh, in all investing, we've done, we, if you guys have ever been There's hearing our show, we've talked about pros and cons of flipping, pros and cons of real estate, uh, buy and hold, and being the landlord. The pros and cons of being the bank, holding the note. And this is a conversation that, that we were having off mm-hmm. the the mic. When you're investing in the mortgage note, if they do not pay you, mm-hmm. right? Just like in a landlord, you have to evict. You and then you have to go in there and basically see what the damage of the property is. Hopefully they didn't trash your place, fix whatever needs to be fixed. As the bank, you need to foreclose. Yes. And essentially, it's the same idea as an eviction. Depending on which market you're in is how long the foreclosure process takes. Depending if you lent to an investor versus a homeowner. A homeowner. So rule number one, you want to make it easy. Do not lend to a homeowner. Number one, because there's a lot of laws that says you need to do X, Y, Z to make sure that that person can pay you back. That's mm-hmm. called underwriting. Yep. That's why the banks have guidelines. And when it, wherever you're a first time home buyer or if you're buying your primary residence, your second or third time purchasing a house, we all have to follow the guidelines. We have to sign a bunch of disclosures. We all have to send a bunch of paperwork for them to review. There's all kinds of agencies and consumer protection agencies who protect the homeowner. Correct. So basically... Stay out of the primary residence lending game. There's a lot of people out there that do it. Um, I get phone calls all day, every day asking me if I'm willing to do private lending on a primary residence. And the answer is no, because here is the reality that nobody tells you. If that person doesn't pay me back and I go to foreclose, we got to go to court. Mm -hmm. And the judge is going to say, okay, this is this person's homestead. This is their primary residence. The government of the United States is not here to kick people out of their houses. <laughs> no. uh, contrary to, <laughs> to some people's beliefs. So the reality is they're going to make sure beyond a reasonable doubt that it's all good to drop the gavel and mm. say, get out of this house. You're going to make sure that everything was done to the T that you're supposed to do before they even do that. And if I didn't do one thing, one thing, <laughs> like these issue. people can potentially stay in there longer mm-hmm. and stay in the house and it can go on for brother. I've seen foreclosure proceedings go you on for years. One, that was like two, three years, right? Yeah. I was with a, a, having a dinner with the cash home Queens talking about um, the next uh, quarter. Yeah. And she did a short sale. One of them was doing a short sale where the guy has been in the property for 15 years and he has this attorney in Boca Raton, which I'm like, give me this guy's number. Let me see who this guy is. (laughs) Who's supposedly that good at knowing how to keep keep pushing it back and keeping a guy back. And I personally think even that short sale process that she was helping him with was... So she was helping him. He's trying to short sell the property. They were trying to short sell the property. He's been there for 15 years. He's been there for 15 years and they were going to short sell it. And then for whatever reason, the short sale didn't go through. And I'm thinking they were probably pulling your chain just to continue to buy (laughs) more time. Yes, (laughs) Like that short sale was probably a hoax just as another gimmick to keep pushing time. Mm. And that's what's out there. Some of these attorneys know the game and they could buy you plenty of time. And of course, why? Because they're collecting their monthly or their yearly and people will rather pay a much cheaper fee to the attorney attorney than what then pay the mortgage. So because this exists out there, especially in South Florida, but all (laughs) over the country, 
the primary residence game, you do not want to be the bank in because there's too many laws, too much paperwork, too much protection. So you want to stick to the investment game. In the investment game, you just want to make sure you do your due diligence that the property appraises, that the title is clean, so you Mm -hmm. do title work, that the property is insured because, God forbid, there's a hurricane or there's a fire or whatever it is. And while you're on insurance, too, one one thing that you want to make sure you do, because you might not know this, is make sure that you, the bank, are on the insurance policy. Correct. The mortgagee clause. If Kevin finances a deal for me, his mortgage company is on the insurance policy as additional insured. The same thing when I finance a deal for somebody else, I'm additional insured. So whatever my company I'm using is on there as additional insured. Right. That means you're going to get copied. You're going to be considered basically the first lien, the, which you are. Yeah. And, you, and you're the point of, of contact as well as the person who's buying and taking out that insurance policy. They will tell you if they haven't paid the insurance. Mm-hmm. They will tell you if there's a change on the insurance. And you, as the bank, need to keep up with that because guess what? If there's a fire and mm-hmm. it burns down and the insurance company doesn't pay for it, where's your money? Your money's gone. Exactly. Money's so gone. you do, there is a little bit of due diligence. Yeah, but that's very simple. I mean, it's, it's required. Just read your mail. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's required that that has to be a part of their insurance policy. And then, you know, if you get a mail, from an insurance company that you don't know? Read it. Or you do know? <laughs> Open it up. Read it. If you got a question, <laughs> call. Ask. That's it. It's not It's not a rocket science and it's not heavy lifting either. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day. Um, but the investment angle is definitely like where you want to focus at. And understand, especially in a lot of these little, these cash flow markets, right? <laughs> Most private lenders right now don't want to loan below $75,000. Like Correct. me and Kevin have been talking about this a lot lately. They just don't want to do it. There's too much hassle for them. Right, so if you if you have the money where you can get a deal and then finance somebody else underneath that threshold, it's an open market yeah. to investors. Most like there's a lot of investors looking to just buy a house for sort of financing terms. Right, yeah. put five ten thousand down. I would suggest this, and and more on the pros and cons tip. If you're investing, let's say it's a thirty thousand dollar deal, you got to see the condition of the property, which is why the appraisal and an inspection of the property is important because if this property is in terrible condition and needs major rehab, now you need to see how much equity is in that property because if you're lending $30,000 and the property is, let's say, only worth $40,000, if that person doesn't pay you and you have to foreclose on that property and you go in there and to fix this property up, like you said, a furnace, mm-hmm. a roof, windows, interior. What if the rehab is basically the same amount of what <laughs> you've invested? Now you're thirty thousand in debt because you lent this person thirty thousand, and the repairs are thirty thousand. That's mm-hmm. sixty thousand dollars. The property is only worth forty thousand dollars. So you have to do your due diligence, definitely, and make definitely. sure you're not getting into something crazy. Yeah, I mean, basically, when I'm when I'm doing the, the notes that we're doing, you know, we're looking at the property, we're walking that property. Because remember, every deal starts off the same way, and we just evaluate it. Can we wholesale it? Do we keep it as a sort of finance deal? Is it a good rental, right? Is it a hotel or is it a flip, right? So you, you have to do all the same steps up front. It's your exit strategy didn't change. It's what you want to do with, with your exit strategy. Um, another con they'll say to us a note is that the property comes off your balance sheet, let's say, right? You don't own it forever because it's not a rental property. So when that homeowner pays it off. Right. Seven years you, later. Then you lose that income. Right. right. But you've made 30000 with 10% interest over seven years. So you might be walking out, getting your 30000 back, and you made an extra twenty or whatever exactly. it might be. And that's why I say it's not a con. You'll hear other investors say, oh, it's a con. I don't own the house. Yeah, but you you are putting in right. Let's say I buy a house for twenty five grand. I sell it and sort of financing for fifty thousand. I'm already putting my appreciation into that house up front, right? I'm not banking on the market going up and getting an appreciation. I already already counted it in fifty thousand plus ten percent interest, right? Right. So my appreciation is already built into that deal at the beginning of my purchase, right? right? Um, the pro to these type of deals is that they cash flow no matter what. So let's say you foreclose on it. And let's say even if you have to fix a few things and get it back up, if the value isn't there to flip it or to sell and get your money back right in that moment, because let's say seven years from now, the market's dipped and in this market, it might have gone down. Then you rent it. You rent it. And then you cash flow 
You make that money just like if they were paying you the mortgage. Mm-hmm. And then when the market comes back up and it cycles, then you can get out of it if you want to or keep cash flowing it. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's the pro. If they have, that's the con they, that they uh, you have to foreclose on them, right? A lot of guys I know, they get a house, they sell or finance it, right? Somebody might They might not pay two years down the road. They do the same thing and fix it up. They sell their finance, get another down payment, right? So you're collecting a down payment up front, which is more than your security deposit, right? And the security deposit isn't really yours. The down payment on the purchase of a house when you own a real estate note is yours, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of guys are doing this over and over again. They don't mind the fact that they might have to foreclose. You don't want that to happen. But let's say it did happen. Usually the property's fixed up, hopefully to a better condition than it was when you got it. If you, if you do them as is the way I'm doing it, you just do the whole process all over again. So... Right. The you only that, the only downfall there would be is if you walk in and that guy trashed the place. Yes. Which another thing that we put on our on our land contract, the sort of financing contracts, is any major. It's their home, so they can do renovations. Anything structurally that they do to the property, they have to give permission from us first. Right. That's a part of our. Because some people <laughs> think that they're build Bob the Builder. <laughs> <laughs> and then you walk in there and you're like, this is the new living room, bro. I'm scared to sneeze in here because it's going to come down. <laughs> Another con that people will say is that you lose some of the tax benefits you do to a rental property. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and it's a good good segue to end uh, a cool episode. I think this was a great topic, but we've talked about it in the episode for buy and hold. Mm -hmm. If you're a landlord, you get the depreciations, you get the expenses. So there's a lot of tax benefits in being the bank. Essentially, it's just like your W2 income, or it's just like any other deal that you make money on. They're going to tax you on it. And there really isn't anything that you could write off other than whatever your expenses were to market to be the bank. Um, Maybe some administrative uh, servicing services. Yeah, those, yep. Right. So, either way, it, you make great money. You factor that in. So, when I'm deciding what the interest rate is, I'm making sure that it's not a uh, 6%. No. <laughs> That's what you're going to get at the bank. Yeah. These people, nine out of 10 time, want quick closings. They're not trying to go to the bank. I know I'm going to get taxed on it. So if I lend it at six, I'm really making 4%. Exactly. So if I do 10%, I get taxed at eight. I'm still making 8%. It's beautiful. I'll do that deal all day long. Yeah, ours, ours are usually 10, 11%. That's right. usually where we're at. Um, but yeah, you lose some tax benefits. But then again, you're building that into the beginning of the deal, right? So it's, to, it's not really a con. And that's also why I always suggest you do a mixture of rentals with seller finance notes, right? right? Because you still get, especially if our main income's coming from wholesaling deals at the beginning, right? Or return to cash flow deals, having a couple of rentals per year with your portfolio is going to balance out those tax hits. Yeah. So the, my, my filter when I see a deal, if I can get a deal and the price point is where I can fix it up, rent it. The reason why I want to fix it up is so I could be hassle free, rent it, refinance and get my money back out of it or most of my money back out of it. I might consider to hold that as a rental because I'm in it for free. Mm-hmm. If it's a multifamily, I might consider holding that also for a rental because it's a good multifamily. If it's a good Airbnb spot, then I'll keep it because Airbnb is making at this point two to three times more than rental. So the cash flow is crazy. Yeah. I'll keep it. If it doesn't fit any of those three criterias for me, then how can I be the bank? It's kind of how I look at it. It is. And, and the best thing about being the bank again is, look, every single house that I sell and sort of financing, we sell it as is. Every single one. We're not going in there repairing the house and so on and sort of financing. No, I'm getting a house for a certain price, a wholesale price, a wholesale terms. And I'm turning around and marketing that house as is to use an investor who's going to fix it up himself and he wants a rental property or he wants to flip it. But again, if it's under $75,000, he can't find a bank to loan on it. Or he already has 10, lo- you know, 10 loans in his personal name for convention that we can't find anymore. Right? So we're taking it as his property and just selling it on seller financing. And my only money into it is the acquisition for that price of that property. The right. rest of that, there's, there's no time rehabbing it. And I'm getting a monthly principal interest check for, I mean, we're doing 15, 20 year terms, you know, because I honestly just, I want the cash flow. 
I'm not trying to get paid off that quick. You know, some of them do fall in that seven to 10 range, but if I can pay my private money off of it in five to seven years and have 10 years of free and clear cash flow, right. that's the whole game, you know? It's all a cash flow game. <clears throat> right. It's just another it's another tool in the cash flow game. Yeah. In the tool and, belt. And if you have small reserves right now, I think it's a better tool than buying a rental property because we all know rental properties take a lot of money. <laughs> you know, they're going to take money. They're going to take time. Yeah. You know, unless you do it, you know, the, the, we, we are big about doing it the right way at first, but you know how it is. People don't always have enough money to go in there and fix it up all the way. So that's stress free, right? right? Oh, I leave the AC, just, <laughs> but I did a tile in the bathroom. You know, cool, you're just trying to get into a cool. rental property, right? And lots of times that rental property can end your, your investment career kind of, kind of quick, right? Where I say, hey, find those same properties and sell it to another investor and sell it financing, right? Get some cash flow coming in right away that you have stress free while you're trying to build up your reserves yeah. for those rental properties and then mix it. If you guys have 30, 40, 50, even 25 grand, and you don't know where to put those, those are conversations we want to have with you guys. So definitely Definitely. look us up. You can hit us up on social media. You can hit us up through the website, shutupandinvest.com. And uh, we can find the deals and help you guys place that capital, but don't sit on the sidelines. You see the stock market right now. There's guys already calling about, hey, we're going to put my money at. If it's in the bank, it's not doing nothing but sitting there, right? I mean, we're like, these are guaranteed, you know, as, as much as guaranteed can be, but these are 10, 11% deals, you know, that you get in your money right now. It's is, funny, when you look at your 401k, really look at how much you've made in your money on the 401k <laughs> and then call them and say, if I pull this money out, how much do I, get? How much do I actually get? And then redo your numbers. Because I'd be surprised if you're getting over 5% most of the time in your 401k face value. Uh-huh. And then when you pull the money out after fees and penalties and withdraw this and this and that, there's a lot of people making less than 2% on their 401ks, bro. And that might be another episode we have to go over. But, you know, the, 40, the 401k scam <laughs> that, they, that they teach us that we need to have. It's really a scam, but that's a whole different, you know, different topic. That's, yeah, we'll be you know, for another 30 minutes you know, here. But, um, you know, especially older, you know, baby boomers and stuff who have a lot of money in 401ks, right? If you just keep that money in the 401k, it can get wiped out. Trillions of dollars were lost over this week on 401ks, right? If you can buy a real estate note, you don't want to rent a property, I get it. You buy a real estate note, there's profit and interest coming to your pocket, right? Yeah. A lot of people don't talk about back in 2008, they talk about the crash and the economic drama. They talk about how a lot of people, the foreclosures and all this, and lost their homes. I know a ton of people that lost their whole 401ks. Those, I was watching it. The stock market was down below three. It was around three, 4,000. I mean, Fred, I remember watching the bank stocks were like below, some of them were below dollars, mm-hmm. right? People's pensions were wiped out. Yeah. If you were looking to retire in 2009, 2010, you had nothing to retire on. Mm-hmm. And I see the same thing. I, just, I was talking to somebody the other day. They're like 28 years old. They're like, oh, my 401k, you know. Like you, and they think it's guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Like people think they're walking around with a guaranteed four hundred one k that never can disappear. Yeah, and they can be wiped out completely. You know, completely. Yeah. And we don't. They don't. They don't want us to know that though. That's the whole point. You know, it. it it's kind of a what we're talking about today, and what this episode is is taking charge of your own future, taking exactly. charge of your own finances. Stop investing in things with hope blindly. Oh, I'm going to put this in the mutual fund. I'm going to put this in the IRA. I'm going to put this in the in the 401k. And I'm going to hope that when I hit X age, so it's going to be able to take care of me. Uh-huh. Start investing in some notes. It's a great investment. There are still discounted notes you can buy. There are still people who are, I'm restructuring three notes right now. A guy, an investor has three homes. He's on a land contract in Michigan. He's like 68. He's trying to get out of them. Um, you know, a couple of them are behind some payments. I'm going to buy that. I'm going to buy the portfolio from him. It's three notes. We're buying $30,000 $30, a piece. The homes are valued at about 65000 each, mm-hmm. right? So because the people who are in the houses are behind us in payments, he's selling it to me at a discount. Mm-hmm. And we're going to go in there, restructure their land contracts mm-hmm. and keep them in there. You know? And if not, then they get and out and not, you're in there for... Them, we'll do it again. And we're in there for half the value of the price. I got a guy that works with us. He invests through us for notes and he's like... It's a win-win. I either get a property at a cheaper price than if I were to pay for it, or I'll get interest. You get interest, yeah. So money. he has no <laughs> issues if it's time to foreclose because he looks at it as just another mm-hmm. property he'll own. 
Yeah. I mean, in the seller finance note market, I mean, when you realize how to originate notes, which I'm sure we'll talk about in another episode, but when you can originate your own notes, dude, I mean, I think it's the greatest path to generational wealth that I've seen because, you know, you can actually calculate what you're getting and it's true prop principal and interest without the hassle of the repairs and the taxes and insurance. It's something that you definitely need to add to your portfolio if you're investing. <laughs> <laughs> Trillions of dollars. The bank never loses. <laughs> bank never loses. I played Monopoly a couple of days with my kids. <laughs> I'm always the bank. <laughs> Catch you guys in the next episode. Hey, thank you once again for listening to Shut Up and Invest. If you guys are motivated at the thought of continuing your real estate journey with us, then visit shutupandinvest.com. There you can join our community and take advantage of more free resources. And don't forget, please like, comment, and subscribe to this podcast so you're first to hear our new content every week. Most importantly, get active and don't forget to shut up and invest.